All right, is the mic working? Yeah. All right, great. Okay, um, so the presentation is on uh, breadth first and A star search with the Ruby standard library. So there's nothing in the code base that uses anything outside the Ruby standard library. And uh, the code's there, uh, the link for the presentation's there. And uh, but first, uh, a little bit about me. Um, so I started learning software development about four years ago. And uh, currently I work at a company called LegitScript in town. I've been working there for about two years. We do work in Ruby and in Clojure. Uh, for the last two years, I've been working solely on our Ruby projects, uh, except for starting this Monday, I'm working full time on uh, our Clojure projects. Um, we're hiring right now for a senior DevOps engineer position. So if you're interested or know anyone who might be interested, please take a look at LegitScript.com, the career section. Um, it's, a, it's a really great place to work. Um, OK, so graph search. Uh, so just in case you don't know, uh, a graph is basically a connection of, a collection of edges and nodes. And that'll become clear as the presentation goes on. But for example, if you had a map of the highway system of the US, the nodes would be the various cities and the edges would be the various highways connecting the cities. Um, there are lots of applications for uh, like the field of like constructing and searching um, the graphs that you construct. Uh, it's a pretty vast one. There are lots of applications, web crawling for Google. Uh, I was uh, kind of interested to learn recently that speech to text translation, um, there's actually the construction of probabilistic graphs and the searching over them in order to take a, an incoming audio signal and find the most likely um, text translation, uh, what, what you're actually saying um, in the English dictionary. So I was interested to find that. Uh, Uber, they're, um, just until recently, their ETAs, uh, when you call a car, they, uh, just until recently, they're using A star search to give you an ETA of uh, when your car will arrive. Um, Rubik's Cube, um, starting from any random sh state of the Rubik's Cube to in getting to a solve state, uh, you can solve that with breadth first search, find the minimum number of moves that you need to, uh, need to do on a Rubik's Cube in order to get from your shuffled state to, the, to a solve state of the Rubik's Cube. Um, lots of inter interesting applications and subfields in, um, in search. Today, we're going to focus on uh, two forms of search, this kind of proto-search, breadth-first search, uh, discovered in 1959 by Edward F. Moore. Uh, and it was published as a part of a paper, I think, in, find, in solving this problem of finding the shortest path through a maze. Um, and A-star search was developed roughly nine years later at the Stanford Research Institute, uh, in the context of this project on, for Shaky the Robot. Um, that uh, was basically a robot that part of its task was to find its way through an obstacle course. And so A star search was developed as a faster way of uh, pathfinding through an obstacle course faster than just breadth first, breadth first search. Um, so I pulled up some visualizations so that we can get a bit of an intuition of uh, what these two search methods are uh, before we move on. So. This, um, this little JavaScript program that I found on GitHub, uh, what it'll do is it'll allow you to perform various searches uh, that'll start from this green node, and you can put it wherever you want on the graph, and it'll search until it finds the shortest path from the green node to the red node. And uh, you can put a bunch of gray stuff up there, which just represents stuff in the way, buildings or whatever, if you want to think of this as a map. And we'll look at breadth first search and what it's doing is breadth first search starts at the green node and kind of expands in these concentric circles, looking out further and further. And you can kind of think of it as the computer just scanning its eyes in concentric circles around the green node until it's seen the red node. And it scans in such a way that once it sees the red node, immediately it can calculate the shortest path from the green node to the red node and, and return it to you right away. And so, um, so this is kind of the, the way that breadth first search progresses in concentric circles outwards. What A star search does is it, it basically behaves like breadth first search, 
uh, except with one little additional piece of information. You give it a heuristic, uh, kind of an idea of what direction should you search. Breadth first search just pr progresses in layers. A star search, you give it a little bit of information and you let it know, hey, it's a little bit smarter to kind of search to your right. The red node is over to your right, so start looking that way. And you can see it goes, it performs much more quickly. Um, basically because it's been given information on uh, roughly how far are you and in what direction do you need to go uh, to get to the red node. And we'll see, uh, we're actually going to confront that problem of developing a, a useful heuristic for uh, a different problem. So our problem, our application today is this problem. Um, find the fewest edits it takes to transform one word uh, into another uh, with all intermediate words uh, found in the English dictionary. So by transformation, I mean um, find the fewest transformations. Each transformation is an edit. And so an edit is add a letter, uh, subtract a letter, or take one letter in your word and change it to another letter. So cat, one transformation you can get from cat to cot if you change the A to an O. So that's, uh, that's the idea of a transformation. And so, like, the shortest path from cat to dog would look like this. You start at cat, one transformation to cot, then to dot, then to dog. And each leap from one word to another is just one edit. And every word that you land on is a word uh, in the English dictionary. So those are the two constraints. You're, you're constrained to moving by an edit, and you always have to land on a word. And so I found this problem online. And immediately I thought it was intriguing and thought uh, I somehow had the intuition that A star search would be really useful even though I've never, I've only read about A star search and had never implemented before. So I thought it would be an interesting personal project to actually implement it. Uh, so if we zoomed in on cat, this is kind of perhaps what the graph looks like close to cat. Um, one edit away, adding a letter, we could get to chat. Subtracting a letter, we could get to at. Add, uh, changing a letter, we could get to mat or to cot. Uh, and there are all kinds of words connected to cat. And so that's what the graph looks like if we zoom in on cat. Um, cat's a node. Chat, cot, at, mat, those are all nodes. And the edits are edges between the nodes in the graph. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to be given, you know, just an arbitrary word from the dictionary like cat and then a second target word, uh, dog, and we want to be able to perform this search over the graph in order to find uh, the minimal path from uh, cat to dog. And I developed this base class that contains most of the logic. A star search and breadth first search is so similar, I was able to extract most of the like meaty logic into this um, base class here. Can everyone see the code all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought I'd uh, talk through it just a little bit. Um, like a few highlights of it is we keep uh, this set of visited nodes. So whenever we visit a word, we store it in the visited nodes and we remember that so that we never come back to that node again and perform. We don't want to continually perform breadth first search or A star search from the same node. We'll just end up in an infinite loop probably. Um, and so we keep a set of visited nodes as we go, and we keep a queue. Um, and we uh, basically call this helper function make a start state by taking the start node, cat, for example, and, um, and put it on the queue. And the, all the helper function does is wrap cat in a few useful things where we'll keep track of the path that we've followed so far, and uh, we'll keep track of uh, the current node or the current word at the end of our path. So if we go from cat to cot, um, it'll keep track of the path and know that we're on cot as a last word. And so we'll cycle. As long as the queue is not empty, we'll look at the, what's at the front of the queue. Um, we'll use this helper function uh, neighboring nodes to find all the words that are connected to cat or to cot or wherever we are and go and check those out. And as long as those haven't been visited, We'll um, update our state, visit those, and push onto the queue a search state for each of those um, paths that branch out from cat and so on. 
And so that's kind of our concentric circle uh, that breadth first search builds up. We'll be at cat, we'll visit all its neighboring nodes, and we'll, we'll push those onto the queue and keep track of how far along we are from cat. So what does breadth first search have to bring to that logic to actually work? Uh, not too much. Um, the default queue that we use. So the, the thing that's going on, um, if I take a step back before explaining this, is like what this really boils down to is being really smart about how we use the queue. Um, that's the basic difference between A star search and breadth first search. With breadth first search, we just use a basic queue. Uh, a queue is just like a line at the grocery store. The person at the front gets served first, and then the new people who come go to the end of the line. And so uh, with breadth first search, we put uh, new, new words that we visit onto the end of the queue. And we always visit, um, the, we always pop off the queue the words that have been there the longest. And so, um, and so if you, uh, yeah, the words that have been there the longest. And make start state make next state, um, those are just basically taking the path and uh, wrapping them in a search state so that you know when we pop something off the queue, what word are we on and what's the path that we've taken so far uh, to that word. And so breadth first search um, is actually a provably correct, uh, it's good to test your implementation, it's a provably correct algorithm and so uh, uh, as long as you haven't done anything, introduced any bugs yourself and have kind of followed along the formula uh, you should have a pretty good uh, algorithm. Uh, I have implemented tests just to check myself. So A star search uh, is just slightly more complicated than that. Uh, for our queue, we use a heap. And so um, we have to assign a priority to uh, an incoming search state that we, that we insert into the queue. And so uh, as we saw in the illustration, we kind of gave priority to things that were to the right of, uh, of the green node. And when we, so unlike a queue at the grocery store, when you use a heap, which is like a priority queue, you throw it in the queue and uh, things at the higher, higher priority will kind of bubble up to the front. Um, and uh, make start states pretty similar to what we had before. Um, this, the real, kind of difference here between breadth first search and A star search are what the search state looks like and what the make next search state looks like. So search state is uh, inherits from the kind of base search state that we had and it just adds a comparator method here. Uh, we give a, we pass in a priority for the search state and we allow things, um, different search states to be compared based on that priority. And the only reason we do that is because we're feeding it into the heap and the heap needs to know the priority of the various elements that are getting inserted in so that the ones with the higher priority can bubble up to the front of the heap. Um, so how do we assign a priority? So when a, we want to make a new search state, um, we take the new word that we're visiting. So next node is, so we've jumped from cat to chat or cat to cot and we pass in information about the target node that we want to end on, dog. And the way we give a priority is we basically ask, what's the length of the path we visited so far? Uh, remember, we want, in the end, we want to calculate the minimum. We want to be able to return the minimum path. So we, part of the priority is the length so far. Um, we don't want to prioritize things that have just gone on and on and haven't gotten anywhere when there are other shorter paths to uh, investigate. And then we also just take the edit distance between the next word that we're jumping on and the ultimate goal word, which is um, dog. So for example, imagine you're at cat. Should you jump to chat or you should, should you jump to cot? Well, cot has a shorter edit distance to dog than does chat. And so you want to prioritize uh, uh, moving to cot over moving to chat. And this is just. Uh, the reason we do that is it's kind of a, a guess. We just add a heuristic that's something, you want to add something that's simple and fast to calculate that's not going to slow down your search, but might give it the search uh, routine hints as to what, what's a better direction to go. 
And so with edit distance, we kind of underestimate. Um, from uh, caught to dog is two edits. It might take longer than that to actually jump from a dictionary word to a dictionary word rather than, um, but edit distance gives us a good tight lower bound on how many dictionary words we need to jump from caught to, to dog. And so that's, our, that's basically our A star heuristic for this problem, um, the thing that helps um, optimize our search and make it faster than breadth first search. And we'll see some benchmarking soon um, that will allow us to compare. So testing strategies, uh, the classic testing strategy is to construct your own input and uh, so you know what the output should be. So constructing your own small dictionary, I did that when I was developing this and um, so I knew what the shortest path was from any two words. So I just had like 20 words in my dictionary. It was easy, easy to keep track of. Uh, compare results of different implementations. So uh, another sanity check is just make sure breadth first search and A star search both find uh, their shortest paths. They're both the same, same length. And test against real, known real world results. So I knew cat to dog. I already knew uh, what the shortest path looked like. So I was able to throw that into my like real world test. Uh, and I did a real world test against user slash user share dict words, which is a, um, a collection of a, roughly a quarter million English words. Um, it's on most, it's, I think it's a, a Unix standard. Um, and this dictionary is used for like autocomplete and spelling correction, um, things like that. Uh, various programs can take advantage of it. Um, and so let's like, let's like actually take a look. All right, so we can take a look at the relative performance of breadth first search versus A star search uh, on this problem. So, can make it bigger? oh yeah. Also, can you show us what's in user dict words? <laughs> I can do, yeah, I can ask for the, the head of the file. Yeah, that would be fine. And so, I just, uh, when I was benchmarking, I was just coming up with random pairs of words to see if there actually was a connection, uh, some way to get from cat to mistrial. Uh, you see that A star search got it done in uh, less than a second, whereas breadth first search took 22 seconds. Um, left, right, A star search less than half a second. Breadth first search is still chugging away. I think the, the longest path I got was 12 words, which is from computer to virus, which is coming up soon. <laughs> That's nice. um, so I'm keeping, I'm using Ruby benchmark and I also developed like this wrapper around my queues that would collect statistics on the number of times things were pushed onto the queue and popped off. Um, and so you can compare times, but you could also compare like the number of pushes and pops from the queue um, for the various searches. Uh, I think this is the longest one, then the other, the rest will finish up pretty quickly. And it looks like they're taking different paths too, which is fun. Yes, that's right. Yeah, there are multiple paths, shortest paths. Are they deterministic? Uh, no, no. And so, yeah, the, um, they'll, um, the method, the method that I use to look at neighboring words, it'll be the same for both, but, um, because the heap is kind of bubbling things up to the top, whereas breadth first search isn't, um, they'll end up shuffled slightly differently after they enter the queue, if that makes sense. Well, if you run the same algorithm. Oh yeah, lines, yeah, I'm just gonna, sure. if I run this benchmarking again, yeah, it's gonna look exactly the same. Uh, all of them had connections except for zoology and zoologists. Those were disjoint. There was no way to get from one of those words to the other in the dictionary. That's right. Yeah, it's because uh, Q, um, regular queue operations are constant time, whereas heap operations are uh, logarithmic time, uh, logarithmic in the size of the, of the queue right now. And so, yeah, um, both of these will exhaust um, the number of connections that are in your uh, kind of connected graph around zoologist. Uh, you can see the queue stats look the same. But yeah, breadth first search will finish faster because it'll just exhaust the graph faster. All right. Um, 
Yeah. Let's see. So where was that dictionary located? User sharing. Yeah. So it's just a new line separated. Um, all kinds of weird words in there that I've never seen before. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you know, um, well, I, I forgot to mention one other cool uh, application of search is actually uh, robotics, uh, motion planning. Um, if you can feed in some kind of information about your environment to uh, a robot, uh, it can use that to plan its move without wasting a bunch of time and energy um, actually physically searching around its environment. Um, so I, if you're interested, I put up a link to these slides and there's a resources slide here um, about uh, resources for learning. Um, uh, search if you're interested. This Udacity class I think is amazing. Uh, it's taught by Peter Norvig who's the head of research at Google. So like if you know Google X, uh, he's basically the guy and head of like research in general at Google. He's amazing. Um, it's taught in Python. Uh, but he's a Lisp guy, so you kind of learn Python from a Lisp perspective, which is which is pretty neat. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. They were also still desired to be fast. Um, compared to like uh, here, the Ruby agent team has that test suite that could take however long they want. It could take several months if they wanted to run it that long. Um, so, what do you call that type of test that uh, is like actually is very long? It's not meant to be run in CI. It's just sort of like a compare against other examples or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what to call it. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I had a couple of things, uh, right. I didn't know the right answer for, except for cat to dog, uh, for the rest of them. And so what I wanted to do was kind of iterate on my testing. Um, I had a good sense. Of, I had done breadth first search and applied it several times before, never before I had done a star search, but it was so similar that I was pretty sure first step about the logic. Uh, and so I was kind of leaning on like, yeah, this implementation looks sane and I know breadth first search is provably correct. Uh, so that gave me some confidence and then I wanted to, um, you know, do the unit tests. Uh, but still, like, you, uh, unit tests are nice, um, but you can't think of all edge cases. So when moving on to the, this benchmarking, which looked at a real dictionary and just um, ran it, whatever popped into my mind, randomly chosen pairs of words. Um, I did want to have two implementations. And one thing that I really like to have uh, when dealing with real world cases, if I have the time to let it churn, is I have this optimal implementation, A star uh, search. Uh, or I might have something that's at work, I might have something that's tricky. Um, it's optimal. Uh, you have to analyze it a lot to really be sure it's correct. But on the other hand, you could have a brute force approach that you just is obviously correct. And if you can um, run tests and compare that brute force equals, uh, equals your op optimal output, you don't have to actually control the inputs. You can have real world inputs. And as long as you have confidence uh, in the brute force approach and you have time to run the brute force approach, then you can compare those. And I've uh, used that testing strategy a lot too. And I think it can. Yeah, I think I think it's a pretty good approach as long as you have, um, uh, yeah, as long as you have the time to do it, and then you can kind of take 
a quick check type approach. Uh, if, you're ha if you're familiar with uh, Haskell's quick check library where you can just throw a bunch of random input rather than stuff that you control ahead of time. Uh, you can, th uh, if you know that br uh, brute force is going to always give you the right answer, then you can just produce millions of, of uh, test cases just randomly and uh, really figure out edge cases. Uh, that's actually a great way to figure out edge cases in, uh, in your code, in your optimal code that you think you've analyzed and gotten right. Quick check is actually found, um, as a side note, it's actually once found a bug in the closure core library. After millions and millions of tests, it, like on test three, 30 million, it found, I don't know what the number is, but um, it was actually able to find a, a bug uh, in the closure library. Um, uh, I can't remember the exact context beyond that, but it's, it's, it's actually a kind of interesting way to go about testing. And that's why I wanted to have breadth first search run along A star, um, just because A star was new to me. And breadth first was kind of like brute force. Right. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, when I first developed A star, I used, a, I didn't use a library to do my own edit distance calculation. Um, and it might, uh, if I go back and look at my edit distance calculation, it might actually be an un underestimate of edit distance itself, uh, which is fine. Uh, A star search, by the way, is provably correct as long as your heuristic always never overestimates the distance between your current node and the target node. As long as you like exactly estimate it or underestimate it, you're always going to find the shortest path. Uh, and so I think I wrote something that actually underestimates edit distance, which I knew, like edit distance would underest underestimate the distance, and then underestimating that underestimate uh, was fine and safe. And uh, yeah, and so I didn't I didn't use a library for that when I first developed this. I used a library for uh, heap and uh, link list. I don't think it was in the Ruby standard library, so there was one a gem called algorithms that I used. But then um, I had some extra time on my hand, and I was interested in in implementing my own heap, and so I went. I got rid of uh, third-party libraries and just implemented everything um, just using the Ruby standard library. All the data structures, uh, yeah, I implemented directly myself. One thing I noticed as I was uh, as I was watching through this is that you talk about uh, breadth first and A star as being graph search techniques. Right. Um, but then you talked about uh, searching user share dict word. Oh right. Which is a new line. It's not a graph. List. Yeah. So how did you build the graph? All right. So I I, I wanted to cover that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I ran out of time. Um, so yeah, I have some helper functions. Okay, so first of all, and it, um, I did not uh, construct a graph from user share dict. Um, I, I read it in and stored it into uh, a tree, a try, a prefix tree, and so saving a little bit of space. Um, and so I don't actually have all these individual words in memory. I have them saved in a prefix tree, and that helper function um, actually will take a given word and search the prefix tree. So there's another graph search going on. It searches the prefix tree for all words that are one edit away. And so this graph is actually kind of virtual. It's not hard coded, or I mean, it's not, um, it's not stored in memory anywhere. The edges and nodes, neither, neither of those exist in memory. Um, they're just kind of virtual. And so I'll just pass in a word to the helper function and it'll search over the tree to find all the edges that reach out from a given, given word. Cool, thank you.